Hi, this is Jeff Blauett, technical agronomist for Cooperative Farmers Elevator. And on this week's Field Friday segment, uh, I wanted to touch on something that we have very common in this part of our geography in Northwest Iowa, uh, manure applications, liquid manure specifically uh, in the fall. Uh, if you look behind us here, uh, you can see a field here of corn that's already been chopped for silage. Uh, you can see that there's some knife trails out here that kind of go at an angle to the row. And we also have a greenish tint uh, in this field from a cover crop growing. So what I wanted to touch on is uh, the manure applied to all of our acres. We're using that for the fertility um, aspect of things and, and trying to supplement our, uh, our needs for that crop that way. But I wanted to touch on some of the basics of fertility and you know a little bit of brief chemistry as to what's going on and what the risks are uh, with what's going on out here. We're out here the beginning of October. Um, we've been out through a you know a period where it's been kind of cloudy and with a bunch of rain. Uh, we've got a lot of water in this system right now. We've had probably anywhere from on the low end maybe three all the way up to six inches in some areas in the last week's time, maybe week and a half. Um, so we've got moisture in our system, which is good. It's making harvest a little bit slower pace than we probably like, but um, I wanted to touch on what that means for uh, fertility aspects of this manure um, and the timing of this. So if you think about the soil itself, the soil particles, soil profiles have a negative charge chemistry-wise. So with that, with that being said, your positives and your negatives attract in chemistry and you know it's just basics. So the manure that we apply and most of the nitrogen we apply initially gets applied has a has a positive charge. So we all know nitrogen moves with water. That's kind of what we've all been taught. That's true, but not entirely true all the time. When we put a lot of these forms of nitrogen on, manure also being one of those, it goes on as a positive charge particle. So no matter how much rain and water goes through the profile, if we're not washing that soil physically away with erosion, it's not going anywhere. It's attached to that soil particle. What becomes a challenge is when it goes through a chemical process in that soil based on microbial activity with a couple of bacteria called Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter, they convert that nitrogen from a stable, attached, positive charge form to a negative charge mainly nitrate, and we all know nitrates would end up in our water. It's all because that's nutrient, that nutrient is mobile in there now, and water going through the profile will take it with it. So then it ends up in our tile lines, and our rivers, our creeks, and then our, eventually the Gulf of Mexico for this part of the world. And of course that's causing us some, you know, some problems with our uh, general public's opinion of agriculture. But, so, what do we have going on and what can we do about it? Some of which we can uh, have some impact, some of which we're just relegated to what Mother Nature does to us. Uh, we can put uh, nitrogen stabilizers. You've probably noticed we've been uh, emphasizing the products like Instinct uh, more readily the last couple years at CFE. Part of that is it's you know environmental stewardship and it's also trying to do everything we can to maximize the production in these fields and minimizing costs. We don't want to have to throw more nitrogen in these fields. Our manure management plan probably doesn't allow it anyway. And so what we're putting on with this manure needs to be here so we can utilize it and that crop can stay fed. So having those stabilizers in the manure definitely helps. We're even putting it in with a lot of our fertilizer sources today for the same reason, to kind of keep that nitrogen there longer. Um, we also try not to apply manure or anhydrous, for instance, until these soil temperatures get below 50 degrees um, and stay down below 50 degrees in the fall. The reason for that is those bacteria really get to a lower active state, almost go dormant once that soil starts to cool down. And that obviously helps slow that process or stop that process of that uh, conversion of that nitrogen to a mobile form and nitrate again. This field you can see has a green tint, has cover crop. One of the concepts of cover crop, if it gets enough size, it can absorb some nitrogen, whether you know most of your grass crops are gonna absorb a lot of nitrogen. Um, even some of the uh, turnips and, and uh, radishes and some of those things, they'll absorb nitrogen 
if they have enough time to grow and get into where that manure and that nitrogen is at. So just because it's green doesn't mean we're taking up much yet and we may or may not get enough time for that to help and to happen. But I know we want to try and get this stuff done when it's nicest, when it's easiest. Some of it's logistics. I get it. We're in the custom business. We can't do everything in an ideal time. Uh, sometimes we have to go and we don't really want to, but we have to. I get it. Manure business is that way. We've got to get all this stuff on before it freezes up and before that window shuts. But just to be understanding um, what the ramifications of that are. We're putting on this manure in this field probably the middle of September. Um, we had soils within the last week, week and a half that were still in the low to mid 60s. It's cooled off down now to the mid 50s um, with some of these cloudy rainy days. We're going to need some sunshine and some warmer weather here to one, help dry the corn and dry the soils out so we can go with harvest, which hopefully we get. But with that, we're probably going to see the soils warm back up again. And so we're going to have a period of time in here where that bacteria can be active on these forms of nitrogen. The stabilizers help. The stabilizers are applied to suppress and, and thin that bacteria population down so it doesn't have as active of conversion for a period of time, but it only lasts so long. The stabilizers help. The stabilizers are applied to suppress and, and thin that bacteria population down so it doesn't have as active of conversion for a period of time, but it only lasts so long. Um, but if you think about applying manure in this field mid-September, um, we, you know, it depends on the year. We may not have soils that are below 50 degrees and stay there until, you know, it can be the first of November, so another month yet. Um, it all depends on the weather like a lot of things, but so if we look at that, we've got six weeks potentially, maybe longer, maybe less, but let's just say six weeks of time where that bacteria can be active we're not really going to need a lot of that nitrogen on next year's corn crop probably until late June, uh, get into July where we really start to have a lot of need. Um, we're going to have soils warming up probably like last year we had it in March uh, where it warmed up but for sure by April we're hoping to have warmer weather where we've got soil temperatures warming up. Um, when that soil warms up when it's time to plant corn you're also activating that bacteria out of its dormant state again. So figure that being the end of April, you've got quite a period of time in there where that nitrogen can be in a converted form and be mobile again. So I just want to bring to the bring to the attention that this is important and this is why. We get calls all the time in a year where we have a fair amount of moisture where we've got corn that's short of nitrogen. And the response oftentimes is, well, if the manure I had on, I should have no problem with enough nitrogen here. My Manure analysis said I had X amount of nitrogen on and I put on even a little more than I had uh, credit or had permission to do, wink, wink. Um, how can I be short? Well, what sometimes is forgotten about is the application timing and what weather that had gone through before we actually got to this need point. There's a reason why a lot of the nitrogen we want to put on is, is you know, as close to need as we can. That's why there's more interest in top dressing and later applications because we have a tendency to lose some if the weather goes against us. But so how do we know if we're losing, you know, we can have nitrogen that's mobile but not enough water going through the profile that ever takes it anywhere. That happens sometimes and that's great, but how do we know that? Some of the things that you can look at are, are the tile lines actively running. If the tile lines are actively running, we have water going through the profile. Um, that's why we apply a lot of tile and have tile on these fields uh, to keep that from being too wet. But if they're flowing, we have nitrogen going through the system very likely if it's mobile. Um, we also have a few other local tools just uh, with some, some measuring devices that can maybe help just give us, a, give us somewhat of an idea. Um, we have a couple of weather stations that Iowa State has uh, out, in the, out in a couple of fields within our territory that are measuring stuff and it's available online. Um, let's go look at some of those and I'll, we'll discuss that. So this is one of the weather sensors and the weather uh, tools I was mentioning. Uh, this is part of what's called the Iowa Soil Moisture Network. Um, you can see we've got a pretty extensive weather station here. Uh, you can see over there we've got a, a rain bucket that's measuring rainfall of course. You've got wind speed, wind direction, um, you've got a solar panel here to operate it all, give it power, but you've got 
It's measuring sunlight, solar radiation, it's measuring evapotranspiration, um, pretty much everything we need to know about the weather. Um, and it's archived online uh, every hour, all the way back to, I believe, 2013 or so when we put this station in. Um, there's a station like this. This one is right northeast of Dune, a couple miles. Um, we also have one over along Highway 59 near Ocheedon. Uh, those are two main weather stations in our area, and then we also have one by the winery in Inwood that has some of the sensor capability. So we have kind of three, and then one down by Sutherland, um, the four nearest us to give us some weather information. But the interesting part from what we were talking about for our discussion here today is what you don't see. Uh, when this was put in about 70 feet out into this field underneath the corn, uh, there is sensors out there that are at 12, 24, and 50 inches in the soil. They're buried sensors and they're measuring two things. They're measuring moisture content, they're also measuring soil temperature. Obviously those are both pretty important tools for us to know and we were talking about is water moving through our profile and in, in enough rain lately that would do that. Well, this would give us one way of showing whether there's water getting down to those sensors and how long does it take and is there water movement. If you look at uh, these, these graphs, you can see some spikes in moisture percentage. Um, at the sensors are all denoted by different colors. But if you look at that, you can see that we do have some water going through the profile right now, and we've got a full, a full system. So we're gonna to continue to move water. If we've got mobile nutrients out there, we're gonna move them as well. So I just thought I'd kind of touch on that today since that's an important thing that's going on right now, and it's you know got potential to affect us in the next year, and I just want everybody to understand uh, what's behind it. Um, so with that, Here's today's Field Friday segment, and I'll have the address here, so if you want to look this up online, you can see those. So with that, we'll see ya.